Max Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Greetings from Berlin and a warm welcome to our Highlights edition. And here's a look at some of what's coming up over the next half hour. Acquired taste. Berlin has a new center for art and culinary delights. Unique fit. Norwegian designers make it big with a one-piece jumpsuit. And riding the rapids, adventurous souls can try out an Olympic whitewater course. But first, we stay on terra firma to take a new look at the role of the bicycle. And while most people use it simply to get around, German photographer Horst Friedrich sees it as a fashion accessory. Well, he started to think that way when he moved to London some 15 years ago. And he's now documented dozens of stylish British cyclists. And the result is a brand new book. London is not a traditional cyclist's paradise, but these people are bucking the trend in more ways than one. For many of them, bikes are a means of transportation and a status symbol. Horst Friedrichs has captured this trend in his photo book, aptly named Cycle Style. There was one thing, above all, that fascinated him. That moment when someone all dressed up gets on a super slick bike. That's the moment. That's when the camera clicks. The book covers a huge range of cycle styles, from old school gents bicycles to fixed gear and folding varieties. Among the latest looks in London right now is apparently the neo dandy style. Fashion designer and avid cyclist Paul Smith was among the big names to have his picture taken. Horst Friedrichs was primarily interested in authentic snapshots. I stop people on the street and ask them. That's what I find so interesting. Real people, no models, they're boring. Horst spent over a year training his lens on around 200 cyclists for the book. They all have one thing in common, their pride in their two-wheelers. In some cases, Horst Friedrichs himself, a passionate cyclist, had to spend weeks looking for motifs. Other shots came about spontaneously as he wandered across London. Basically, your perfect photo is always of a person. A person with their machine, their bike. They have to have a strong character, then the rest happens naturally. You find the right location, the right spot, and then the right lighting atmosphere. But the basics are all about the person. Horst Friedrichs might take dozens or even hundreds of shots before getting the right photo. Different bicycles suit different occasions, of course, for traveling to the office or going out partying, or indeed for sporting purposes. Yeah, bicycle is quite important and uh, in the lifestyle basis. So, uh, so I just, just like I, I treat my, my clothes or shoes, I just treat my bike in the same way. Friedrichs is from Frankfurt, but has been living in London for 15 years. He works as a photographer for major magazines and newspapers. In 2008, he won the LEED Award in Germany for a photo reportage series. Before cycle style, he took an interest in other kinds of bikers. Other projects took him further afield. To Mali, for example. Photography was always a key to the wider world. I noticed early in life when I got my first camera at age 15 that it was an incredible tool. The camera was like a kind of mouthpiece to express yourself with. Cycling has undergone a renaissance in London in recent years, with twice the number of bikes compared to a decade ago. A popular stop-off is this cafe Look, Mum, no hands on Old Street. It's a place where Londoners can take a break or even repair their bikes at the workshop. For Horst Friedrichs, 
It's a treasure trove of photographic motifs. I think in London it's important for people to make a statement with their clothes or their bicycles. They like riding and arriving in style. It is important in a city that is very fashion conscious. Horst Friedrich's own preferred model of bike, in case you're wondering, is a rather unpretentious number. His fascinating pictures are currently on show in Germany, Britain and the Netherlands. Well, now over to Berlin, which you could say is in constant cultural flux. Ever since the fall of the wall more than 20 years ago, former rundown districts have been given some pretty dramatic makeovers. And many of the 400-odd commercial galleries now in town, as well as top eateries, are concentrated around the city's Mitte district. But there's always room for a little bit more. Euromax checked out the latest hot space with the help of one of Germany's best-known gallerists. The former Jewish girls' school in central Berlin stood empty for nearly 16 years. Now it's filling with life again. It's in the Scheunenviertel, one of the main Jewish quarters in pre-war Berlin. The neighborhood now boasts Germany's highest concentration of art galleries. Among the first to appear in the 1990s were the Institute for Contemporary Art, KW, and the Gallery Eigenart. This is the third exhibition space Eigenart's founder, Gerd Harry Dübke, has opened. He numbers among Germany's foremost art dealers and takes credit for discovering superstar painter Neo Rauch. In his new space, he'll be featuring many international artists, starting with Ryan Mosley from Britain. Our third space means we can give room to artists who've repeatedly caught our attention over the years. People we've all noticed, myself, my colleagues and co-workers, as well as the other artists I represent. The former Jewish girls school has space for culinary creations as well, with a restaurant and bar already open below and a deli coming soon. The upper floors are devoted to art, with three galleries already in place. A historic museum is soon to open as well, an eclectic cultural mix. I wouldn't have come in here if it had been purely a gallery complex, but the mix reflects that in the neighborhood itself. Auguststrasse is like the main artery for the art scene here. And now, this is the heart. Michael Fuchs came up with the concept and spent 4 million euros refurbishing the building, which is protected as a historic site. Then he moved in with his own gallery and used his excellent connections to bring already successful eateries and galleries in with him. The idea was to have everything under one roof. Galleries, exhibition space, several restaurants and a deli. We wanted to have one place to bring them all together. On the ground floor, the kosher classroom offers special cooking classes to go with its menus. Kosher inspector Leon Goldsman makes sure the strict Jewish dietary laws are observed. But anyone with a reservation is welcome for the Friday Sabbath dinners. Of course, they're open to everyone. The clientele we've had so far has been totally mixed. We've had people from South America, for instance, who weren't Jewish, and people who just wanted to sit together on a Friday evening in relaxed surroundings and experience this kind of ritual. It's not so much about food as about recreating a piece of Jewish culture in the heart of one of the capital's hippest districts. It's really buzzing here. You can really feel the vibe. And I never would have thought it was even possible for me to be a part of it. The kosher classroom used to be a real classroom. The Nazis closed the school in 1942 and deported and killed most of the girls who went to school here, along with their teachers. Photos on a wall commemorate the victims. 
The building was returned to the Jewish community in 2009. The renovation saved it from ruin. The Polly Zoll on the ground floor is a restaurant named after the lamps made of Murano glass by Polly of Venice. Both the menu and the interior were inspired by the Berlin of the 1920s and 30s. It's run by one of Berlin's leading gastronomic teams. Dining and art, past and present, come together in the halls and rooms of the former Jewish girls' school. What's really interesting is not just the history of this place, but that it's being filled with life again. You can just turn the door handle and come in, and suddenly you realize how much life is pulsating here. The former Jewish girls' school is set to become a magnet for gallery goers and gourmets alike. Well, imagine some leisure wear that can be just as much fun for the super duper athlete as for the classic couch potato. A one piece jumpsuit is the latest fashion statement to come from the Norwegian capital Oslo. It's the brainchild of three young guys who decided they needed something a bit comfier and more convenient to wear around the house. Well, meanwhile, stars like Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber are actually sporting them out in public. And now the one piecers have taken to the street. What look like rumpers for grown-ups seem to be taking the world of celebrities, trendsetters and fashion bloggers by storm. The success of the one-piece jumpsuit has even surprised its three Norwegian creators, Henrik Nostrud, Knut Gresvig and Thomas Adams. Since we wore it the first time we wore it out into town to Oslo, you know, everybody was like, what the hell are you guys wearing? It, look, it looks ridiculous. But 12 months, 18 months later, we've sold to 2% of the population in Norway. Oslo is the One Piece founder's hometown. This is where their success story began, before their product moved on to make a splash in other European and North American cities. If you wear one, you're sure to attract attention. I like them very much. I can recognize some Norwegian reindeer and um, American flag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice colors. Everybody got kind of uh, hooked and uh, Many people bought it, so... <laughs> I don't know, then. it's yeah. not my style, I guess. <laughs> I think it's very sexy. They look like pajamas or, or baby, baby uh, outfits, you know? It's true, you know, we all remember when we were one year old, <laughs> lying in our uh, bed with a romper on. But, you know, it's, yeah, as it's Henrik says, though, it's, it's two arms and two legs, so it's, um, it's um, even though it's, um, look, it's, it's the same thing, it's, it's also different. One Piece has its headquarters in an industrial park in the small town of Frogner near Oslo. The three 20-somethings now have about 50 employees. It all began in a search for cozy comfort after a night on the town. We had a hangover Sunday morning in 2007 uh, and we discussed how to make uh, more comfortable uh, clothing. Uh, and we wear the knut um, had uh, pants and a hood and then we sew the, and it was quite cold in Norway. So the, he likes the hoods tight, so it was dropping up all the time. And then we decided just to try to sew it together. Uh, and then the first one piece was born. They solved the classic problem of having to relieve yourself when wearing an overall, at least for men, with a two-way zipper. Since they started, Nostrud, Gresvig and Adams have designed about 160 different models. They don't just vary the colors and patterns, they work with designers from around the world. They themselves never attended fashion school. I think it's an advantage because you have to think outside the box and uh, find something new. And um, so it has not been a problem to don't have a fashion education. Then you learn about what have been done before and uh, not, a, not so much about what nobody had done before. Since 2009, the three Norwegians have been selling their collection online. Many fashion blogs and magazines have reported on the striking jumpsuits. That could be because celebrities such as Canadian teen idol Justin Bieber 
British boy band One Direction and Irish singer Ronan Keating have been seen wearing them. Just sipping this up instead of putting on a, a bathrobe or something like that, you know, it, it's perfect for that. And um, it's, it's so perfect for that that people kind of just wander into the streets and forget they're, they're wearing it and, and it becomes a part of the, the, the street life as well. The unisex overall from Norway was originally meant to be worn at home. Some people think it can be worn anywhere. For others, it crosses the line when it comes to good taste. Well, this year in Germany, we're celebrating the 300th birthday of Prussia's King Frederick the Great. That means there will be countless special exhibitions to illuminate the man best known as a modern thinker, but also a belligerent military commander. Well, he was also a music lover and a virtuoso on the flute, for which he also composed. And now that facet of his personality is being reinterpreted by Swiss flautist Emmanuel Pahu, whom we met in Potsdam. There could hardly be a more fitting musical backdrop than the Royal Theatre of the New Palace in Potsdam Sanssouci Park. Virtuoso flautist Emmanuel Pau and the Camera Academy Potsdam are performing a flute concerto that was composed by Frederick the Great himself. When a king speaks, it's another language, a different approach to life. He has a different view of existence and the existence of music as such. When you perform a flute concerto by Frederick, you need to bring that attitude into your performance, the royal bearing, the majestic gravitas. A king is never rushed, never passionate, never entirely lets himself go. In the mid-18th century, the cross flute was a new and therefore highly prized solo instrument. Johann Sebastian Bach and his son Carl Philip Emanuel Bach wrote many works for it. Frederick the Great composed many himself and commissioned others to write more. Emmanuel Pau has now collected some of these on his new double album, The Flute King. Given his international reputation, Emmanuel Pau could be called a flute king himself. Frederick the Great was a virtuoso flute player, but unlike Emmanuel Pau, the Prussian king initially had to pursue his passion in secret, as his father disapproved. Friedrich the Große came. Frederick the Great began with flute and music because it was his passion. I can understand that because at age five, I told my parents I want to play the flute, to play the Mozart concerto I'm hearing now. Before that, I had no idea what music or a flute was. It was just something that had to be. Adolf Menzel painted the king playing the flute, capturing the mood of one of Frederick's musical soirees in the Sanssouci Palace. Emmanuel Pau in the Red Room of the New Palace in Potsdam. Frederick, who was the King of Prussia from 1740 until his death in 1786, composed more than 120 works for the flute, but he never published any of his compositions or played them outside his court. He never performed in public. He only played for his guests or in the company of his composers, court musicians and invited guests. He never played for his people, only for his private amusement. Still, he practiced two to four hours a day. For his Flute King project, Emmanuel Pau enlisted the help of British harpsichordist Trevor Pinnock, an esteemed specialist in the music of the period. The two musicians are accompanied by Potsdam's Kammer Academy Orchestra. It's certainly a reverence to Potsdam and to Friedrich. And the fact that they have such good quality meant that they're absolutely the right orchestra to do this. It wouldn't have made sense to go to another orchestra. When there's such a good orchestra in Potsdam, then obviously that is the choice.
Das ist wirklich ähm, diese, dieses äh, Dream Team aus. It's really a Dream Team. Äh, Musicians from the region where this music has its roots, and then Trevor Pinnock is a specialist as well. Today he plays a similar role on the harpsichord to the one Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach was thought to have played at the court of Frederick the Great. Soll am Hof Friedrich dem Großen. Emmanuel Pou will be performing music fit for a king until the end of March. Well, some of us can hardly wait until the Summer Olympic Games kick off four months from now in London. And while a few facilities are still in the finishing stages, one venue has been up and running since last spring, and that's the Lee Valley Whitewater Centre. Now, it will be hosting the canoe slalom events during the Games, but it is currently open to the public, and people are flocking to ride the same rapids that will rock the world's best athletes this summer. Catch a raft down the Olympic course. You might not take a canoe or kayak like the pros, but you can still test the wild white waters. It's meant to be challenging, but safe. Uh, an artificially built track doesn't have any hidden obstacles. We know exactly what's there, but if you're doing it in the Alps or somewhere like that, can be lots of hidden obstacles, which increase the danger. Here, it's smooth concrete and blocks, so we know exactly what's under the water. It's 10 a.m. on Sunday, and one of the rafting instructors at the Whitewater Center is showing a group what they do if they fall in. Flip Tolley and her friends have made the hour-long trip here from Cambridge. She and the others have to pass a swimming test in five-degree water. It's the 37-year-old sports instructor's second time here. This was a Christmas present for my mum. Um, so she knows how much I'm looking forward to the Olympics. So um, it was a good experience. I've been rafting before. So uh, I wanted to say I've been on the Olympic course. The 25 hectare facility is located on the outskirts of London in the massive Lee Valley Regional Park. It boasts two concrete bedded tracks. There's a 160 meter long course for warming up and another stretching 300 meters, the real Olympic course for the canoe slalom event. There's an adjustable obstacle system for the pros, which incorporates more than a thousand movable blocks, and amateurs can test out the course now. This one was first opened for general public, so the public can try rapids before athletes, so that's what's unique, and that's why uh, so many people visited the center as well. And uh, I think it make a uh, you know, people are more interesting about the sport as well and they bring a legacy uh, for the kind of sport. The Lee River leads south to the main Olympic Park in East London. After the Games, the facilities here will stay open. The showpiece aquatic center designed by star architect Zaha Hadid is due to become a public pool. Londoners will also be able to use the park's BMX and mountain biking trails and the new velodrome. The organizers of the Summer Games have taken a sustainable approach. The first idea of the site in the park in East London was that we had the possibility of a large area of land in single ownership that was very underdeveloped, it was derelict, a lot of waste ground, a lot of pollution. And we could bring all this together and the Games would be a catalyst for fast-tracking a regeneration of this area so that we could create a long-term benefit for the wider communities. Should we do a little high five, a little paddle high five? The Whitewater Centre has been drawing in the crowds. The centre already boasts 8,500 visitors per week, twice as much as initially expected. And that's despite the steep ticket price. Flip Tolley and her friends paid the equivalent of about 60 euros for one hour of rafting. We crashed around and we surfed and we did it three times and every, every different thing we did was just great. It was very controlled. Um, and feeling like it might capsize, that was good. Yeah, when it span round and round, that was really good, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. We felt like we were going to be flown out of the boat, <laughs> hanging on for dear life. I think our instructor um, liked to um, make it fun for us. Flip Tolley will have a while to wait before she can come back. The Lee Valley Whitewater Center will close in two weeks, 
so organizers can set up the grandstand for up to 12,000 Olympic spectators. And we'll be looking forward to that. Well, it is time to wrap up this edition of our Euromax highlights. Hope you enjoyed it. And until we meet again, alles Gute aus Berlin. Tschüss and bye-bye.